Hi, I'm Patrick Taylor, and you're watching me through my nice new camera. It's a Samsung NX 1100, and if you've watched any of my previous videos, you can probably see that the video quality, certainly in HD, is quite a lot better than my old video camera. And that's certainly one of the features I really like about this new camera. Um, but there's one or two features which I'm not so keen on, or rather, I think are missing, certainly from my old uh, still camera. And one of them is a time-lapse function. So, a time-lapse function enables you to set the camera to automatically take photos over certain periods of time. So, 30 seconds or 5 minutes, say. And then you can take these photos and squash them down into a video file and get really high-speed motion. You quite often see this thing with you know, clouds moving across the sky. Uh, but my camera, the new camera, doesn't have this function. So, I decided to sort, sort that out. And I built what I uh, believe is known as an intervalometer, measures intervals. And I can use this to control uh, the camera. So I plug it in, set the interval, and it, it takes the images. So instead of an inbuilt function, it's an external control box, really. And uh, I'm going to be going into this in quite some detail, sort of exploring all the different uh, ways in uh, which I built it. And there's sort of three aspects to this project. There's the circuit, the timing circuit, which allows me to time the, the, the shots. There's the interface with the camera through this micro USB lead. And there's the 3D printed case, which of course I'll be touching on. Um, there's actually a fourth bit, which is uh, an adapter for the camera. So uh, mains through to seven and a half volts DC, and then this goes into the, the battery compartment of the camera. And this uh, takes away the, the sort of limiting factor of the battery, which was what was causing me problems before. Um, so I, I could set it going, and after a few hours the battery would run out. And this was all very well if I was going to be around and I could change the battery, but of course if it was night time and I wanted to take a shot of the night sky and the stars moving across, I, I don't want to get up. I, I want to sleep, really. Um, so the first thing I'll be talking about is the timing circuit for the intervalometer. So here's the schematic for the final circuit. And at face value it looks fairly complex, so I'm going to run you through it in stages. So this is the, the basic switching circuit, and uh, this box here uh, represents the camera. And suffice to say for the minute that uh, it's got two inputs, and when they're shorted together, the camera takes a photo. I'll be going into more of the interfacing a bit later, but th that'll do for now. And as you can see, we've got the these two uh, pins here uh, in a parallel circuit with a couple of simple switches. So the first one is the red push button on the uh, the intervalometer, and this just allows me to take a photo without touching the camera if I want uh, as little vibration as possible, for instance. The second one is the latching switch which allows me, if I've got the camera setting uh, set to bulb mode, uh, allows me to take an exposure of whatever time I want up to, I think it's four minutes. So when this switch is closed, the shutter is open, and when the switch goes open, the shutter closes again, and the picture is processed. Uh, now this transistor here uh, links down into the main timing circuit, uh, which is uh, what I'll be showing you now, and uh, again, simply uh, short out the, the contacts effectively. And this is the main timing circuit. It's uh, an operational amplifier oscillator. So we've got our two inputs for our operational amplifier and basically what an op-amp does it amplifies the difference between these two inputs uh, at its most basic level. It's like a, a comparator. So if the non-inverting input uh, represented by this plus here is higher voltage wise than the inverting input then inside the op amp it'll amplify it by many hundreds of thousands of times uh, basically until we reach the the supply rail which here I've got uh, is 9 volts so even if there's a, a tiny tiny difference between these two if the input here is slightly bigger than this one here then the output goes up high, it goes to 9 volts and if the input here is ever so slightly lower than the input here, then the output 
goes down very, very close to our ground voltage. In reality, it's not quite perfect. It doesn't quite go up to 9 volts and it doesn't quite go down to ground, but it's very close. So that's our basic operation. Now, however, we've got all sorts of feedback going on. And the first thing that's interesting is uh, our RC timing circuit. So we've got uh, a resistor up here, um, which is quite a lot bigger than 220 ohms in reality. And we've got our capacitor down here. And what this does, it allows us to charge up the capacitor through the resistor from the output of our op amp. So when the output is high, uh, voltage builds up on the capacitor and it charges it up. And of course it charges it up depending on the uh, value of the capacitor and the value of the resistor. That, that depends, that changes uh, how long it takes to charge up. So if we uh, assume our capacitor starts off discharged, uh, so we've got uh, zero volts here and we've got zero volts going in. Now here we have a voltage divider uh, and this also links into this resistor here but we'll ignore that for the minute. Imagine a voltage divider here. So we've got um, a slightly, uh, not, not, a, not a full positive input but uh, roughly halfway in fact. Um, into our non-inverting input. So if the non-inverting input is higher than the inverting input, our output is going to go high and our capacitor will ch start charging through the resistor. Now what this will do is make some voltage build up on our inverting input and the voltage will build and build and build until eventually it actually exceeds the non-inverting input slightly. Of course, what happens then? Well, the inverting input is higher than non-inverting input, so our output will go low. And um, when that happens, our capacitor is now able to discharge via the output. And when the capacitor discharges enough that this uh, inverting input drops below the non-inverting input, it goes high. And it keeps on fluctuating like that. It's an oscillator. That's what it does. Now you probably spotted, there's one component on here which I haven't talked about, and that's this resistor. And it's this resistor which really allows us to do a lot of that stuff, um, to do with the oscillation. And uh, I found quite a, a good way of explaining this. I'll, I'll put a link, into the, uh, a link in the description below with some more information about oscillators from a great website uh, I found, a great, great document in fact. So, when we've got our output here being high, we effectively have another um, positive voltage source. So let, let's imagine that. We've got uh, 9 volts there and 9 volts from our uh, op amp. And of course we've got a resistor in series with each of them. Now these both go in to another resistor, which is this one, and down to ground, as you can see. Now, what these two resistors are doing is effectively forming some uh, two, two resistors in parallel. And of course, when we've got two resistors uh, roughly the same size in parallel, their total resistance uh, drops. So here, which links into our non-inverting input of the op amp, we've got uh, a voltage which isn't actually halfway between the positive supply and ground. We've actually got a larger voltage drop across here because, uh, of course, we've the, uh, the the total resistance here, represented by the parallel resistor network. Uh, causes a, a lower voltage drop from 9 volts to the positive uh, to, to the non-inverting input and a larger input a larger voltage drop sorry across this resistor so when we've got a uh, high output here what's our capacitor trying to do it's trying to charge up and it charges up not to the halfway point represented by these two resistors but actually it's trying to get to a point which is slightly above the halfway point between our positive supply and ground. 
Now, if we look at this the other way, and look at when our output here is low, we've effectively got something which looks very similar to this, but is, uh, is sort of opposite. So we've got 9 volts up here through a single resistor, and then we've got two resistors in parallel to ground and of course our uh, non-inverting input here. Now there's, this resistor is represented by this one up here and these two are represented by this one here and of course this one here because we've effectively got uh, ground here. It's not quite, again, it's a little bit above but for the purposes of this it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good ballpark. So once again we've got a higher voltage drop across here so our capacitor when it's discharging isn't trying to discharge to the halfway point, it's trying to discharge to a bit below the halfway point. And in fact, this resistor is really quite important because if we had a constant input here with just these two resistors and ignored this, then we wouldn't have any feedback from the output of the op amp. What this would do is effectively reduce any effect we've got from the from the timing circuit because once the, the, the voltage here reaches the voltage um, difference represented by by our two inputs so when our input here is the same here we've not got any um, any particularly meaningful oscillation we've simply got uh, an amplifier um, and it, it it wouldn't work in, in certainly in the way we want it to so that's the basic oscillator um, and now I'm going to make it look a lot more complicated, possibly, and introduce some other things. But this is basically the same as what we've got before. So, the first thing you'll notice, there's a lot the same. We've got our two resistors here, forming a voltage divider into the positive input, or the, the, the non-inverting input. We've got our resistor here, forming uh, feedback and interacting with these two resistors. We've got some capacitors, and I'll explain why I've got two of them later and we've got some resistance up here and of course we've got our output. Now there's a few few differences here. Uh, I've tied um, what needs to be tied to ground on the chip to grounds just to make sure it operates correctly and I've added a switch in to the uh, the main power supply for the op amp. That's literally just so I can turn the timing circuit on or off. Obviously when I plug in the intervalometer into the camera I don't want it to start immediately taking photos so there's a switch here which allows me to turn it on and off. Additionally, on the output, uh, I've got a red LED to show when the uh, when the output is high and when it's taking a photo, so that flashes uh, through a current limiting resistor down to ground. And up here, of course, we've got our signal, which goes to our transistor I showed you before, to actually trigger the the circuit which interacts with the camera. Now, this section here is interesting. You see, I've got two almost identical circuits flipped round. So I've got uh, a diode here going through a potentiometer and I've got a diode here going through a potentiometer. And this allows me to vary the mark to space ratio of our oscillator. So the mark is uh, how long the output is high for and the space is how long the output is low for. So when the output is, is high, uh, obviously uh, one of our capacitors charges up through the circuit up here. It can't charge up through the top one because we've got a diode here. It's in the way. It's stopping, stopping any uh, current flowing. So it has to charge up through this circuit. And crucially, it has to charge up through this variable resistor. And of course, when we vary the resistance, we can also vary the, uh, the timing properties of the circuit. Because, um, of course, uh, the higher the resistance, the longer it'll take to charge. And similarly, when the capacitor is discharging, uh, when the output is low, it can't discharge through this route because we've got a diode here. It can only discharge through here, it can only discharge through this potentiometer, and so we can vary uh, how long it charges up and how long it takes to discharge. Finally, the two capacitors down here are simply two different valued capacitors with uh, a switch between them and this allows me uh, to choose uh, finer control 
or less fine control, depending on what sort of thing I'm photographing. So if I want short intervals between my photos, and probably hence some fairly fine control, uh, the switch would be flicked to the capacitor with the smaller value, so that I can get lower timing values and, and more control. And of course if I want to take longer values, I'll, um, I'll use the, the capacitor up here. Using this capacitor, uh, the 100 microfarads, I can get anywhere between uh, a very unusable flashing uh, LED and I think it's 1 minute 30 between shots. And using the 470 microfarad capacitor, I can get up to 5.5 minutes between shots, uh, which, is, which I, I think is quite, quite good going, really. So, if we take a look finally at our, our circuit, our completed circuit, we've obviously got the, the oscillator here, um, represented like this, this big chunk, and our signal going up here to our transistor and our other two switches, which switches our, our camera and triggers it. And here you can see this circuit uh, in action. So uh, we've got our, our red push button up here, which is simply a uh, single trigger. And of course we've got our latching switch here, which allows us to use bulb mode. Now these two uh, implements are push-pull pots. They're generally used on guitars actually, but uh, I found them quite, quite handy here. So to activate the circuit, uh, we simply pull this out and you can see our red LED starts pulsing. Now that's the switch I showed you before, which simply controls the voltage going to the op-amp. So that allows nothing to the op-amp and so it's turned off, and this just simply turns it on. Now, with uh, this potentiometer, we can, uh, we can turn this, by the way, that's, that's what the potentiometer does, and vary the, the resistance, and we can vary the space using this uh, this pot. So, usually I suppose it may well be convention to have mark to space, so you'd expect uh, the mark, i.e. how long the LED is on for, to be on this side and space on this side, but I figured it was, it's more, more likely I'm going to want to control the time be between shots than how long the shutter is open for. So I put the, the most commonly used control on this side. And as you can see, as I twist it further to the right, the uh, time the LED is off for increases. Uh, this pot uh, controls the, the mark, and indeed if I twist it to the right a bit, uh, you can see the LED stays on for longer. Now, a bit like our flick switch up here, I can use that for bulb mode if I wanted to specify how long the shutter is open for on each time-lapse uh, shot. And finally, almost the um, circuit which the switch which controls which capacitor is used is the the switch on this push pull pot so when I pull it up it activates uh, this capacitor I'm not quite sure if you can see that particularly well that's our 470 microfarad capacitor and this is our 100 microfarad capacitor so if I uh, reduce these both to pretty much nothing, um, our circuit sort of wobbles around fairly unstably. Well, our circuit sort of wobbles around um, and flashes really quickly. If I pull this up, you can see immediately it's a slower oscillation. And that, by the way, is our uh, op-amp chip just there. So, on the interfacing side of things, uh, this is what plugs into the camera, and it's a, a micro USB. Uh, fairly simple, um, but probably quite difficult to work out what was happening. I will admit I did not work out how to interface with the camera. Uh, I found out how to do this online. I'll put links down in the description to uh, websites where I found out how to do this. But basically, if you look inside uh, your standard USB socket, you'll find four pins, four metal contacts. Whereas if you look inside a micro USB, probably can't see that very well, no you can't, I'm sorry. Um, if you look inside a micro USB, you'll find five contacts. And one of these contacts is an ID pin. And depending on the resistance between this ID pin and the ground 
and the ground pin on our um, USB, uh, the the device it's plugged into can uh, tell certain things about it. It's all part of the USB on the go specification, and it turns out that if you put a 68k resistor between the ID pin and the ground pin on this thing, uh, then our Samsung NX100, and indeed I believe quite a lot of Samsung NX cameras, uh, detects it as a uh, an intervalometer, well, as, as a remote control, effectively. And if you short out one of the data pins on here uh, to ground, then that activates the, the photo taking on our camera. Uh, it's quite a fiddle to get our 68k resistor soldered into this small package. Um, I was rather hoping that actually the the cable would run the, the, the ID cable that is would run the full length of the the whole USB cable, but it doesn't unfortunately. It ends literally in the package, so you have to solder it on, and it's it's all fiddly and, and not very nice. But I, I managed in the end, and it, it certainly seems to work. Now, as you can see, the packaging for this thing went through quite a few iterations. This isn't all of it, actually. There's a, one or two more pieces, which I've not shown you. Um, but basically, uh, what I've got is a 9-volt battery power supply um, in here, our circuit board just on top of it, and uh, our switches and push-pull pots uh, through holes which are 3D printed in the lid. Now, uh, you'll notice immediately that our, some of our components are actually sticking out the top of the case through uh, specifically printed holes, as you can see here. Um, now, of course, I could simply have made the, uh, the, the height of the whole case that little bit bigger in order to accommodate them. But firstly, I, I didn't desperately want to uh, succumb to space issues in, in, in this respect. And uh, I also think it gives it a bit of character having having some of the components on show. It also allows my LED to poke out nicely and uh, flash and, and tell me when things are happening. Now, uh, technically, I I sort of had in mind the, the the battery compartment here to be able to fairly easily replace the battery. Um, to be honest, I. To be honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't desperately want to try that. Actually, it's. Um, it would probably cause more more problems than actually taking our our cover off. And the cover, uh, of course, is uh, quite a nice clip-in system actually, um, which simply clips in like that. This, this is one of the first iterations, and I've simply got a clip on this side and a clip on this side. Here you can see the. Uh, innards, the insides of the intervalometer. So we've got the 9 volt battery, of course, the circuit board, it's just strip board which I've uh, soldered the, the components to, our two push pull pots with the uh, our potentiometer contacts here and our switch contacts below, the um, momentary push button, and of course our latching switch here. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty tight squeeze in there. Um, obviously I've got uh, some holes in the top to uh, to allow <laughs> some of the the components to fit through. Um, that tight squeeze is, is quite good actually. It feels uh, feels robust and the, um, the clipping system works really well actually to keep that in place. Um, especially with this this clip here to stop um, stop the, the, the end bit coming off. I could have put one here uh, as well. As you can see there's a little bit of a gap showing there but it's, it, it works perfectly well. Got a hole in the side just for my uh, micro USB lead. Um, the wall thickness here was uh, I think it was one millimeter possibly 1.2 but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was one millimeter. Um, and these things printed pretty quickly actually. A uh, quarter of an hour print time for the lid. Um, about the same for the side actually. Um, a fair bit of plastic use of course because of the uh, large surface area but that's, uh, that's unavoidable. So finally of course we've got our power supply for the for the camera and this was is a fairly 
simple thing, but one which uh, sort of was the most uh, dangerous in a way. Um, no, not not so much in terms of a personal safety point of view, but in terms of the, the actual camera, because of course all it takes is to connect the polarity the wrong way round, and the camera could potentially uh, fry. I, I'm not sure, of course, what protection the camera has in it, um, but I, uh, yeah, I would imagine they probably don't consider people might be doing this kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm presuming it's not that great. Although I know there is some. There's uh, certain areas which allow for, I think, dust between contacts and things like that. So it's um, fairly safe, possibly. Now, the original battery has three contacts, which of course for a battery perhaps isn't so normal. You've got the uh, standard positive and negative terminal, you've also got one in the middle. And this, uh, I believe, certainly for this battery, is for a thermistor. So when the um, temperature in the battery, or if the temperature in the battery ever gets too high, the, the camera will shut off. The resistance inside will, will change and the camera will detect that and turn itself off. Now I found out that resistor uh, isn't actually necessary for the for the operating of the camera, um, and I have somewhat left it out. Now, in here you'll notice uh, a little bit of circuitry. We've got uh, a fuse, a one amp fuse, between uh, our input jack and our positive supply here, and that's really just as a, a sort of uh, last safety precaution. Um, I found out the, the camera, when it's operating, draws, I think it's roughly 300 milliamps um, when it's sort of idling, and up to 600 for a few seconds when it's actually taking a photo and processing the data and storing everything to the SD card. So if, if more than one amp's flowing, certainly for a few seconds, something is f fairly wrong. We've also got an LED there, and that's simply uh, a polarity detector. So. In this power supply I bought, um, you can have the potential to connect it round the uh, the wrong way. And if I just plug that in and plug it into our jack here, you'll see the LED lights up, and uh, there's no, no voltage between here. And that just uses a couple of uh, diodes to uh, direct direct our voltage to the um, to the LED as opposed to the camera. Now the contacts here are probably the, the worst bit of the design. Um, trying to drop uh, a blob of molten solder onto 3D printed parts um, doesn't generally go down too well with the 3D printed parts. Um, they sort of soften around 60 degrees and of course by uh, 100, 150, 160 degrees are fairly molten. So. Um, you really sort of have to get this right first time. Um, I don't know what the, the connector for the actual battery is, or even if it's um, commercially available. I suspect it's not, so I have made my own. And they do seem to work, simply uh, two blobs of solder connected to the um, our wires here, and then filed off to form uh, a nice smooth contact. And this um, actually fits into the, the camera really rather well. Like the other case, this case really isn't the uh, easiest thing to clip on, but it slides in nicely and is uh, ejected with a little spring inside the battery compartment fairly smoothly as well. So overall it's a, it's a handy little thing and allows me to take photos for a long period of time. So here's a quick demonstration of the uh, intervalometer. You've probably all been waiting for this, sorry to keep you so long. Um, we have the adapter successfully. Uh, going into the battery slot and powering the camera. Uh, the voltage is, is enough to keep it going perfectly well. Um, it does, however, show the uh, low battery symbol, which is a, a minor aesthetic problem. So, uh, I have it set to manual. Um, this is particularly useful when um, doing time-lapse photography because you get consistent settings and no flickering and of course we have the intervalometer so if I press the red button it takes a photo and that's all good and I can set the uh, shutter speed 
to bulb mode and sometimes this doesn't work I think because of the switch bounce on my latching switch let's just hope it does now um, if I flick this it should maybe not there we go yes um, so it's in the process of taking a photo I'm not sure if you can see down there but we've got a, uh, a counter showing how many seconds the shutter has been open for um, and then if I flick my switch back it uh, processes the photo and of course the actual uh, intervalometer function I activate by pulling out this switch uh, when the camera has finished processing that photo there we go so um, let me switch this back from bulb mode to uh, a slightly more reasonable shutter speed and activate the intervalometer and you can see when the light flashes it takes a photo uh, you can probably hear the shutter going there and it, this is fairly difficult to do with one hand I apologize but I can uh, increase the time between shots there and if I have the the camera set to bulb mode I can also um, of course change the time of each shot using the other push-pull pot so I will activate that and it will take a photo based on the right hand potentiometer of course I need to be fairly careful when doing this that the uh, the time represented uh, here, the uh, space between shots uh, is enough for the camera to actually process the data from the last photo otherwise it'll um, well it'll lag a few photos behind well that's about it from me uh, I forgot to mention uh, briefly earlier the camera itself actually runs off around seven and a half volts uh, my intervalometer uses a standard 9 volt battery but my AC to DC converter uh, I've set to 7.5 volts and I've uh, put some links down in the description uh, for various websites I've used which might be interesting if you, you want to have a go at making your own or, or you're just interested in fact so uh, yeah look forward to seeing you next time I get round to doing another video bye